lost an hour. There you go. My mic is on. I like uh, Brian's poof, right? It was pretty good. All of you watching online, did I say that already? Yeah, welcome. Great to have you. Awesome. God is good? Yeah, excited to be here. It's so good to see your face. So awesome to see all of you. And just before I go to the Word, just want you to, to look at our e-bulletin. There's a process of nomination when it comes to two elder positions. If you're a partner in church, I invite you to take a look at it. Very good. So I would ask you to stand and we'll place ourselves before God. We'll ask him to speak to us and have his way in our lives this morning. Father God, we worship you. We adore you like we did just now. We want to put all our affection on you and our focus on you. We thank you that you desire to reveal yourself to us through your word. You want to speak to us. So we place ourselves before you, Father, wanting to hear what you want to say. So I just pray that you would help me to communicate what you place on my heart, but that you would go beyond my words and that you would just whisper your words that needs to be spoken. So we say yes to what you want to say. So we bring our walls down and we open up our heart to what you want to share and what you want to bring to us and what you want to convey to our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. You may be seated. So we've been in this series of simple faith, and I'm wrapping up the series this morning, and we've been talking on the necessity of faith. Uh, faith is a, an important ingredient when it comes to our life. The Bible is very clear when it comes to how we should walk, that we should not walk by sight, but by faith, right? And faith is trusting God, relying on God throwing our anchor on him and expecting from him. So God doesn't want us to do life alone like orphans. He wants us to rely on a daily basis. We go to his word. We go to him in, uh, when it comes to prayer. And we want to connect with him. We want to hear what he has to say. And we want to walk in, in cooperation, teaming up with him. The Bible says that he has given us the Holy Spirit the comforter, and he's, he walks with us. And what the Holy Spirit wants to do, he wants to glorify Jesus so that can, we can live a life that honors him. And to be able to live a life that honors him, faith is necessary. So we want to trust in God instead of trusting in the sword or in the shield or in our own, uh, by our own, uh, on our own means or effort. We want to rely on God. So this is why faith is so essential when it comes to our growth. I don't think we can grow um, where, we, ca we, where we're, we can't become what God wants us to be if we don't have faith. Amen? Can you tell your neighbor that faith is a necessity? We need to have faith. So what I want to do today is I I'd like to focus on redeeming faith and uh, I was supposed to speak on faith in view of eternity, and uh, I was caught up by verse 31 uh, from Hebrews chapter 11, where we see this lady that is mentioned in the, in the hall of fame of faith or among the heavyweights of, of these men and these uh, ladies that followed God. So if, if you have a, your Bible, take a look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31. It was by faith that Rahab, the prostitute, was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had given a, friend, a friendly welcome to the spies. So we have the story of Rahab, a prostitute that was not destroyed, but she believed in God. We see her story in Joshua chapter 2. And uh, it's pretty amazing when you think about it because, like I said, you have the, hev the heavyweights of the faith in chapter 11. You have um, Abraham, you see Noah, you see Moses, you see Joseph. And also the author talks about that he doesn't have enough time to talk uh, about others uh, like David, uh, like Gideon, like Samuel. But he has enough time to talk about this lady. And it's amazing because uh, this lady is not a Jew or Hebrew, and we'll talk about that in, in a short while, but she is placed in the all of fame of, of faith. And, and so there's really something to learn from her if she's there. It's not by accident that she's there. When it mentions her as a prostitute, it doesn't, God is not tagging her with that. It's just to give us a picture of where she was from, just to give us history about where she was when God came and rescued her. 
If you look at James chapter 2, verse 25, there's another mention of, uh, of um, Rahab. And it, it's, she, she follows the example of uh, Abraham that, is called, that, that he's celebrated for his faith and action when he's willing to sacrifice his son Isaac. And it says in James chapter 2, verse 25, Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was, uh, she was shown... She was shown uh, to be right with God by her own actions when she, did the, when she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by a different route. So what James is saying is that um, Rahab believed in God, but not only believed in God, but she did something about that. She had actions to her faith. And I shared about that uh, last week. And, and it says here in Joshua chapter 2, verse 9, it says, and, and she says that. She says, I know the Lord has given you this land, talking to the two spies. She told them, we are, we are all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror. What, what she does in this text, she acknowledges that the God of the Israelites is uh, uh, the real God, and she knows that they're coming, coming and, and they're coming to conquer the promised land. And so what she does is she makes a deal with them. But what she does is that she believes in God and she does something about it. She, she spares the two spies and she helps them out to, she helps them to escape. So, so James gives this example that her faith was followed by action. What I'd like to focus today, I'd like to focus on redeeming faith. Because when you look at this, um, this example of Rahab, you see redeeming faith. She was a prostitute, and she became a prozelite. And that is someone that is uh, um, brought into the family. She wasn't a Jew, but after um, the story where the walls came, when the walls were down in Jericho, and when the people moved forward, she joined the Jews or the Hebrews, and she became part of the clan. And so what we see in this story is that God has a storyline. When you look at the Bible, there's one main storyline. There's a lot of different streams that, that uh, comes or goes from that storyline. But when you look at the Bible from Genesis to the book of Revelation, there's one major storyline. And it's all about redemption. When we look at God's desire for humanity... The main story for humanity is redemption. God came to rescue us, or God wants to rescue us. And through Genesis to the book of Revelation, there's a desire of God for us to be reconciled with him. And if you look at Genesis chapter 3, you see that first example. It says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, And the Lord God made clothing from animals' skin for Adam and his wife. And here it talks about when Adam and Eve fell into sin, uh, they felt naked. And, and not only they felt naked physically, they were also uh, naked or they felt naked spiritually. And this is where we find the two first sacrifices. When we see these two animals that were sacrifices to cover them, it's a symbol of what they needed to experience forgiveness. There needs to be justice for sin. And this is where you see the Lamb of God found in Jesus, that he is the one that takes away the sin of the world. So even in Genesis chapter 3, we see the need for redemption. From the get-go, after Adam and Eve fell into sin, there was a need for redemption. And if you look at the 66 books in this book, because it's 66 books from different authors, they focus all on redemption, bringing us back to Father so that we can abide in Him, so that one day we will live for, with Him forever. So that's the goal of the Bible or the focus of the Bible. So we see in the preaching of, uh, of the gospel when it comes to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, it says, But we preach Christ crucified as stumbling block for the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. And, and what Paul is saying here is that it's number one, his first calling was to preach Christ crucified. And it talks about redemption. It was a stumbling block to the Jews because they were expecting a victorious Messiah and he came as a suffering Messiah and he also he died on, a, on the wood and, the, and Galatians will say in according to the law that if you would die on the wood, you would be a curse. So he became a curse and he also came as a suffering Messiah so they had a problem to accept him. And the Greek, they saw foolishness because their gods, it's all about take and take and take and take. And Jesus comes and gives and gives and gives. And for them, they, cannot, they could not conceive that God would die. 
Because for them, God came to rule and conquer and fight. But now the, the picture that they saw and or they found in Christianity is a Messiah that comes and lays his life down to reconcile us to Father. So they had a problem with that. But just to say that when you look at the main storyline in the Bible, it's all about redemption. So it's important for us to, to remember that, that the, that the number one message that you find in this book, it's about redemption. And we have this call as a church to preach redemption, the good news. This is why the gospel is the center of this book. It's all about Jesus dying, who also rose again and is coming back. The whole focus on this book is on Jesus. And Jesus came to reconcile us to the Father. So that's the main storyline that you find in the Bible. At the same time, is we all have a storyline, right? All of us, we have a story to tell. We all have a journey. Uh, we have different parents, we were raised differently, we have uh, a different journey, uh, we have victories that we like to share, and, and at the same time, we have defeats. We have great moments, and also we have hard moments, right? And when we look at our lives, our life and the journey, uh, it's all different, but we know one thing is that it's a good thing that God came to rescue us because it says in Roman that we were, all, uh, we were all separated from Christ and Christ came and, and became that bridge. So, so, so when it comes to our journey, what we want to see is to see God step in our journey. And hopefully that has happened in your life or God has stepped in your journey. But when it comes to our journey, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, a mixed up, it's a mixture of mistakes and successes and, and difficult time and great time and and, and, and when it comes to God, let me give you this picture. There's this main storyline that God has, and then I have a storyline. And what God wants to do, he wants to bring me in his storyline. And if you look at Rahab, she had a storyline. She was Amorite. She was an outsider, not part of the covenant. She didn't have a clue about God. She didn't know Yahweh and was not aware about the moral code, the Ten Commandments. The Bible says that she was a prostitute. She was living in sin. It doesn't show how she got there. But she probably, probably lived close to the entrance of the city. And the Bible says that her house was connected to the wall in a visible place where strangers could come in and out. So she was a prostitute. We also see that she had love for her sibling because when she cut a deal with the spies, she wanted to see her family be protected when God would come through his people. She heard about the Israelites, that they were coming, and she was afraid, and she acknowledged the God of the Israelites. But the thing is, she, did, she was not part of God's storyline at first because the storyline was only for the Hebrews. And now we have this stranger that is brought in God's storyline. Well... God wants to um, bring my storyline in his. Uh, God reached for Rahab. If you look at Joshua chapter 2, verse 1, then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies to Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house, as, uh, the, the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. An amazing story where the two spies, they go there. It was probably the easiest way to enter the city because, like I said, it was an open door. But I believe that God wanted to reach her and God wanted to touch her. God had, had heart to touch her because the text I've read in Hebrews chapter 11, it says that she was open but her city wasn't. It makes me think about Zacchaeus in the Bible, right? What a great story of this short man that wanted to see Jesus and was caught up by the crowd and could not, have, could not see him and he went up a tree, right? Like this picture of this young, not this young, but this short guy. I picture him bald like me, I guess. <laughs> he goes up a tree and he wants to see Jesus. And he's looking for Jesus, he sees Jesus, but the beauty is that Jesus sees him, right? And sometimes we think that we're only seeing Jesus, Sometimes we live our lives like we, res we resume our life or we sum up our life as us looking at Jesus, but we forget that Jesus is looking for us too. And as Jesus was walking by, even though there was a huge crowd, he saw him up the tree. He said, I want to have supper. I want to go to your house. And he was a, a tax collector, a major thief, a major thief. 
And Jesus went to his house, and this is where Zacchaeus was touched by the coming of Jesus and at the same time surrendered his life to Jesus by, by his willing to be generous. And you find Jesus going into Matthew's house, and, and the religious people are upset that Jesus is going to a tax collector house. But when we look at the gospel, it's very clear that Jesus came for those that were broken, right? And, and for those that were seeking or for those that had need. And he said he didn't come for those that were healthy. He came for the sick. So when we look at the story of Rahab, we can see that God reached for her. And I think it's just amazing. And I want to let you know that God is always reaching for us. God is reaching for this community. God is reaching for this region and, and for this nation and for this world. But at the same time, he's always reaching for me. He always wants to minister to me. He always wants to become real to me. I need to see that. I need to understand and believe that, that God is also searching for me. We're called to seek God, amen? And we're called to desire for him. But I want you to realize that he's also seeking for you, and he also wants to desire, desire you. Did you know that you value, you have value in his sight? Can you say to your neighbor, I, I, I'm valuable in the eyes of God? I'm valuable in the eyes of God. God search, he's, he's searching for humanity. He searched for me, and he still pursues me. And you look at Rahab, not only he sought after Rahab, but he gave room to Rahab to be part of the storyline. You see, there's a storyline. I've got my storyline, and God wants me to be part of my story. He, he wants me to be part of his storyline. But not just come, it's not just that he wants to bring me in his storyline. Story he wants to give room to me in his storyline. The, the amazing story or the event in the life of Rahab is she is the, the great-great-grandmother of King David. So that means that she is in Jesus' family tree. Think about that. She is not a Jew, not a Hebrew. She is a prostitute. She is disconnected with God. She's brought in, or actually God wants to get her, and God brings her in, and not only brings her in, give room for her to flourish and to be part of that, um, that, that awesome storyline that God has written, that he's still reading, writing today. You look in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David, and David was the father of Solomon. And it goes down to Jesus. What a crazy story when you think about that, right? What an awesome message of grace. Like God is a gracious God. And the reason why we find her in, in Hebrews chapter 11 as uh, still carrying the word prostitute is just to show us that God is a gracious God. So wherever you're from, whatever you've done, you have to realize that God is looking for you. He's searching after you. He has a plan for you. We also see God use her to save the spies. It's amazing. God drew her. Gave room to her, and also in this process, use her uh, when it comes to saving the spy, but also be part of the coming of the Messiah. Amazing. I like what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. But God chose the foolishness, the foolish things of this world to shame the wise, and chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. How many of you, you like that verse? It's an awesome verse, right? It's an awesome verse. you got to say it's an awesome verse because I can see myself in that verse. You know, God wants to reach me. God wants to make room for me. And God wants to empower me. But there's always, well, not me. Not me. Maybe them. Maybe her. Maybe him. And maybe you disqualify yourself based on what you did in the past. And you think that others are better than you. But when you look at the story of Rahab, it's a pic picture of grace that gives us hope that God wants to draw me, wants to, 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 for me to be part of the, this, this awesome storyline, and he also wants to empower me. So God wants to do the same with me. He wants to reach me in my mess, in my situations that are difficult. He wants to give room for me. He calls me son. And daughter, sonship, I was typing the word daughtership and it doesn't exist, but it does. Daughtership. There's a lot of 
ladies here that you don't see yourself as a daughter of the Most High. And there's a lot of men here that you don't see yourself as sons and daughters, uh, as sons and, and, not daughters, but as sons, we'll stop here. And, and the reason why is because you look at your own sins and you look at your own struggles and you define yourself by your struggle and you don't feel and you don't find that you're worthy. So what happens is that you, rege- you, you step away and you, you walk away and you live your own life thinking that there's no grace and there's no, uh, there's no rescue for you. So God wants to do the same with me. He wants to reach me. He wants to give room for me. He wants to make me his habitation. The Bible says that I'm seated in the heavenlies with him, with Jesus. I'm fused with Jesus. I'm co-heir with Christ. You see? So, so he gives room for me. And also Father wants to work through me in this new life. He prepared good works in advance for me to practice. He wants to pour his spirit in me and empower me. You know? It's all based on forgiveness. And this is a struggle I believe the church struggles with. It's forgiveness. Religion is, forgiveness is not enough, you gotta add to it. Forgiveness is, you gotta feel, you gotta make yourself feel good by suffering. But the reality is, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive him. One of the things that we need to realize is that there's forgiveness in God. And I'm going to say it very blunt, bluntly. I believe that when I look at this room and those watching online, there's a lot of people walking with guilt and condemnation. And they're not able to move forward because they have a problem to absorb the forgiveness of God. Remember two weeks ago I talked about that we have to forgive. It, it, you, it, it's, it's not optional. You have to forgive according to Luke chapter 17. And the story goes that if someone sins against you five times and repents, you got to forgive them, right? And actually, the disciples were saying, give us more faith. We can't do this. But actually, what Jesus was talking about is how Father forgives us five times in the same day. When we repent, when we acknowledge our wrong, when we are aware that we want to be, when we are aware of our brokenness and we want to be fixed or we want God to intervene in our lives. So the thing is, there's a danger for us to forget that there's forgiveness in God. We, we have a tendency to believe that we have to add to God's forgiveness. I, I need to receive his forgiveness for the first time or for, and all the time. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says, says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, talking about the, Hebrew, the, the, the heroes, heroes of the faith, in chapter 11, it says, Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning his shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And we're seated with him at the right, at the right throne of God because we are fused with Christ. That's a mystery. Verse 3. Consider him who endures such a position from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So God doesn't want us to grow weary and lose heart. One of the things I need to, to do is that I cannot define my past, I cannot define myself by my past entanglements. Like Rahab was a prostitute that became a prozelite and became the great, 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 great mother of Jesus, grandmother of Jesus. So I can't define myself by my past, you see? When I came before God and I I confessed my sin, I accepted Jesus in my life, I gotta realize that I can move forward. I don't want to live by my past. I don't want to be controlled by my past. Some people will throw your past in your face, but you are called to move on because of God's forgiveness. For sure there's consequences to sin, and for for sure there's a need for... um, restitution, and we try our best to build bridges and to do our best to seek reconciliation. But at the same time, you need to realize that there's forgiveness in God, and His forgiveness is good enough. God doesn't want you to live life with the tag of your past. And at the same time, when you look at yourself in the mirror, what do you see? Do you see yourself as a daughter or a son, or do you see yourself based on the sin of the past? And if you see yourself based on the sin of the past, you will never be able to move forward because the, the, the accuser of the brother will always, the brethren will always throw this in your face that you're no good, 
that you're not valuable, there's no hope, so you might as well just, like, just live your life or be quiet. Well, that's what the enemy wants you to do. But you got to realize that there's power in forgiveness. When I look at this example of Rahab, there's hope, right? Because we see, as where, we see where she was, and now we see where she is. She is talked about in the New Testament, and she is in the family tree of Jesus. you got to say, wow, that's a story of grace. I don't know, as she was married to Salmon, people were throwing her past in her face, but if they did, it doesn't, didn't affect her of being the mother she is and, the, and being part of that family tree, you see? You, you got to know that there's forgiveness in Christ, and you're called to walk in that forgiveness. For sure, like I said, you got to be vulnerable, and you got to bring things to God. I'm not saying here you throw things under the carpet, but you need to see and believe that his forgiveness really works, and it's true. So if you're free from God or free in God, you should free yourself, right? Can you agree? There's no sense of being a slave of the past based on what happened in the past. you got to move on. Like I said, restitution, absolutely. Reconciliation, absolutely. But at the same time, you got to walk in forgiveness, right? At the same time, I'll go a little deeper. I'm not defined by my present entanglements. The truth is we all get entangled sometime or another. My identity is not in my sin or in my shortcoming or my challenges that I face in my life. Whatever I'm facing, whatever I'm dealing with, it's not me. You see? When the Father looks at me, he doesn't see the entanglements as much as he's looking for my face. Imagine in God's um, house, he's got a frame of you. Is it your face or is it Bob Wire's? That he has of you. One of the problems that we do, that we, that we carry as, as believers is that we get attached to the challenges we face or the sin and, we, and the dangers to see that become our identity. And when it becomes your identity, it will give you a destination. Let's say, for example, someone is dealing with anger. Well, anger is not your name if you're struggling with anger. You've got a problem with anger, but anger doesn't define you. So what you want to do is, for sure, you want to repent of your anger. And for sure, you want to feed yourself of God's word so that there would be a change in your heart. And for sure, you want to be accountable to other people. But anger is not you, right? If you look at pornography, and we know that's rampant in our society, and especially for young men when it comes to technology that is so available. You might be struggling with pornography, but you're not pornography. The devil wants to say to you that you're just a dirty dog. There's no hope for you. Stay out of the, stay out of the yard. There's, there's no grace for you. You might be struggling with pornography, and God wants to free you, but that's not your identity. And what the devil wants you to believe, it's your identity. And when you see yourself as, as that, then you see yourself as a dirty dog that has no hope and that has to live alone and you cut yourself from God's grace and you can't step in what God has in store because you've defined yourself according to your sin. It's not the case. So we could talk about sin, but we could talk about other challenges we face. Let's say you deal with depression and it's hard for you. Well, that doesn't define you. Your name is not depression. You might be struggling with depression. It might be hard. You might have some seasons that are hard, but that's not you. The struggles that you face, it def doesn't define you. you got to see yourself as a son and a daughter. There's some issue. There's some entanglements. And there's some stuff that happens to us, but that doesn't define who we are. And what happens is that when we start to define who we are by what happens to us, then we lose track. We think there's no hope. We think we can't do what we're called to do because we look at ourselves in the mirror and we see depression. Oh, I'm just a depressed, uh, this is who I am. It's not, you see? Your identity is found in God. When the father asked you to come in like Rahab, you're part of the family. For sure, you want to do your best to walk in victory and all that, but at the same time, it's not you. You might have problem with uh, 
When it comes to overeating and, and, uh, or you go to food when you go in crisis or whatever, that doesn't define you. This is not who you are. And so, the, so what happens when you define yourself by the situation that you go through and, and the issues you deal with, what happens is you walk in guilt. Can I say this? There's so many awesome people living in guilt. You compare yourself with other people and social media and so on, and you disqualify yourself. The problem is that we all leak, we all have issues, and we want to be healed up, and we want to be set free, and we want to see Jesus come and restore us, but don't define yourself by your sins or by your hurts or by, by issues that you don't have any control over or even issues that you can, you can improve in. Don't let that define you. The story of Rahab is a great picture of that. A lady with a twisted past is now in the Jesus genealogy. Unreal. That's the awesome grace of God. So don't, don't get God by religion that says you're not good enough. Well, you'll never be good enough. Can you say to your neighbor, you'll never be good enough? You'll never be good enough. The only reason why you're acceptable is because of Jesus. And because of that, you want to love him, you want to follow him, because you're just floored by his affection for you. You're just floored by his affection for you. It's unreal, right? Imagine Rahab later on in heaven, seeing her name in Matthew. It must have been unreal, right? And God, how did this happen? It's because of grace. It's a favor of God. Let, let me tell you that God wants to look you in the eyes. He wants to love on you. He wants to value you. He wants to say, son, I love you so much. And we know John 3, 16, so love the world. But I don't think we get that. We want to add on or we want to look good or we want to give this image to others that we have it un under control. But in reality, sometimes we're totally broken in the inside. Oh, life is rough. Right? So don't define yourself by the roughness of life. Realize that Father has his arms wide open for you and he wants to love on you. Any shame will cause you to shut down. And don't define yourself by your entanglement. When you look yourself in the mirror, see yourself as a son and a daughter that might need help, but need to be rescued. Absolutely, but don't define yourself by your entanglement. I need to believe that God qualifies me for salvation. How many of you believe that God qualifies you for salvation? I do. We all do. But I also got to believe that God qualifies me to move on. Even though it's not perfect, even though I'm not where I wish I would be, God still wants to move through me and he wants to walk with me. I need, have, I need to have faith to move on. I need redeeming faith. Rahab experienced redeeming grace and there's redeeming grace for me and you. Again, I'm gonna ask you a question. How many of you, you are defining yourself by your entanglement or by your situation or by challenges that you face? My prayer is that you wouldn't. My prayer is that you would see that no matter what, wherever you are, God looks at you in the eyes and says, I value you. Again, that doesn't mean that you don't repent of your sin. That doesn't mean that you don't bring your things to God. That doesn't mean that you don't trust and rely on him on a daily basis. But you gotta know that you're valuable. You gotta know that you're valuable. That in this crowd, he knows exactly who you are like he did with Rahab. He knows exactly who you are. And he says, son, daughter, I love you. I love you. He looks at you in the eyes and he wants to remove all the shackles or, or the, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the chains. But when you come in, he's not looking at your feet or he's not looking at your hands. He's looking at your face, looking at your eyes. And he says, you're so beautiful. I love you. And, and, and the first thing you want to do is to hide because you feel not worthy. But it's not about that. It's about what Jesus did on Calvary that makes us worthy. So then you accept that love and you say, God, I want to live like a son. I want to live with honor and live a life of honor for you. You see, 
I just pray that you would, your heart would catch this this morning, that you're deeply loved. God had a plan for Rahab. God has a plan for you too. You just got to surrender. Amen. I would ask you to stand. Father, you are an amazing, gracious God. Your love brings me to repentance. Your goodness leads me to repentance. Father, we, we repent of fighting, finding our identity in what we do or, or also finding our identity on what we, in what we don't do. We want to experience you, Father. We want to experience your love. If you're here this morning and you feel and you live like you're a dirty dog based on your past, surrender to God. Give it to God. Maybe you are entangled right now in sin and you're here, but man, you're robotic like you have glass eyes and, you're, and you are in a, in a fortress. You are a prisoner just want to let you know that Father loves you, period. He just loves you and he wants to give you a hug and he wants to love on you. Just open up. Just surrender. Realize that there's no one too far. There's no one too, too far out. Don't disqualify yourself. Don't see you as a loser or see you as a, someone that has no hope. Run to him. Let him love on you. Surrender. Yeah. If you have things that you need to repent, repent. Give it to God. Ask people to walk with you. Ask for help. But know that the Father, what He wants to do, it's to look in, in your eyes. And that's why Jesus came. Jesus came to be this bridge between us and Him. So you say, yes, Jesus. I confess. I, I renounce. I, I let go. And... Here I am. I don't want to live distant from you, Father, and I don't want to also live a life that is not true. So here I am. So I pray blessing upon your people this morning. Pray that you would move supernaturally, that signs and wonders would accompany the preaching of your word, that people would be touched in their hearts knowing that what you did with Rahab you can do to us. Mm. Just to let you know that at the end of the service, we have a prayer room in the back and we want to pray for you. We want to pray with you. Uh, we don't want you to walk and leave this place alone, whatever the situation, whatever the issue that you're dealing with. Amen. So why 
said we are invited to go to the prayer room and would love to pray for you there hope you have an amazing amazing week you're dismissed